all to the seven ages audio journal it's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the cross time pub digging deeper as we always do further into the past and in pursuit of archaeological wonders as well as the icons who changed paradigms with every turn of their trowel of course joining me as always here in studio mr james waldo and mr jason pentrail gentlemen how you doing Doing well, man. How are you doing? I'm hanging in there because it's cool enough weather outside. And by the day, more and more pumpkins continue to show up in my domicile. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the weather's really nice. I'm glad it's here. Yep. Favorite time of the year. Uh, home renovations are in the final stages and I am ready to move in, guys. It's been three months. You still so, aren't in uh, your home. <laughs> So one more project and we'll be done. And then one more project and we'll be done. And then one more project and we'll be done. Just one more thing. It's always just one more thing when you're moving into a new house. So the end is in sight. I'm very happy about it. And hopefully by the next time we meet at the Cross Time Pub, I will be returning to my new home. Yes. I think Tom Petty wrote a song about you, man. I think it's called uh, Don't Live Like a Refugee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. And we do miss Tom Petty. Yeah. We certainly do. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, a lot of archaeologists probably can relate to that. Many of our friends who are in this field spend so much time out there on the road. And by the way, on that note, a very happy archaeology month to you both, because, of course, October is archaeology month, both here stateside and internationally. I saw an interesting story from further west out almost in James's backyard as far as how they are celebrating and the Tahlequah Daily Press reports that October being Archaeology Month also will be figuring in over at the Spiro Mounds Archaeological Center. They're going to be celebrating International Archaeology Day on Saturday, October 17th. There are going to be some lectures, guided walks, and many other activities. And I'm sure, of course, there'll be social distancing for anybody who may be there in the area. That's one of the things that I miss, not only, by the way, the fact that we weren't able to get to Spiro well, on our uh, trip that we were making to many of the mound sites throughout the southeast a couple of years back. But, of course, just being out there on the road, I'm, I really think that uh, our first archaeology trip occurred in October, did it not? Mm -hmm. It did. Yeah, very fitting. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely did. Favorite time of the year and uh, <laughs> one of my most favorite trips that we've taken. Hope to be returning back to the Ohio Valley next year. That's right. Yeah, you've got some research to do up there. Yeah, I do. And uh, I'll take any opportunity to get back because, gentlemen, we only saw, what, maybe 1% of the archaeological sites that were there. So we're certainly looking yeah. forward to getting back to that area. Okay, you've talked me into it. I'll come along. <laughs> All right. Good enough. Yeah. No, I, I would okay, love to get back okay. up there, too. And, you know, I've got so many people who have reached out to me. Since we went on our trip and since we came back on the program and we had, of course, you know, experts like Dr. Jared Burks and also Dr. Bradley Lepper come on and talk with us. It's such a pleasure to get to know the experts who have really helped us, you know, shape our understanding in terms of what the significance of these sites might have been and when they were actually built. In the case of, for instance, the Serpent Mound, arguably one of the most recognizable archaeological sites in North America, maybe anywhere in the world and certainly one of the largest effigy mounds that represents a serpent, that motif that we see so prevalent throughout different cultures around the world. And for pretty obvious reasons, too, I think. There's always something very enigmatic about serpents, although you don't want to run into them, I guess, in the woods. That really does bite. The bite of the snake. 
You know, the snake, of course, the poisonous varieties have fangs. I'll tell you what else has fangs, and this is very in keeping with the season, vampires. That's right. And there was a really interesting article over at the Smithsonian mag where they were talking about how the vampire got his fangs. And I didn't know this. Even if you if you go back, I guess I never paid attention to it because I loved these films when I was a kid. But Bela Lugosi's Dracula, you know, didn't have the customary fangs that we often see represented in vampire films today. And they say that that motif really first began to appear in both Italian and Mexican films in the genre, but that arguably as early as the 1950s, it was Hammer Films starring Christopher Lee in the role that first began to depict Dracula, not only with those sharp fangs, but also, do you remember how his eyes were always bloodshot and red? That gave him a really, really creepy appearance, especially among depictions of Bram Stoker's most uh, well-known character creation but yes here in october with halloween in our midst almost and with pumpkins all over the place around here yeah i thought that would be worthy of mention the history of vampires and of course the archaeological side of that is interesting too because many archaeologists in different parts of the world have stumbled onto burials that actually show signs of an individual being believed to have been a vampire they've been beheaded sometimes a stake driven through the heart it's a rather uh, disturbing cultural tradition, isn't it? Mm, yeah, a little bit. So, you know, vampires are no vampires. I, I can't lie. This is my favorite time of the year. Yeah, well, you know, it's time's cooling off and mm -hmm. it's time for baked goods and all the fun stuff that goes along with October. And uh, Hammer Films, mind you, are great to watch this time of the year. Some of my favorite. I mm -hmm. still have a huge collection of DVDs of Hammer Films. One of my favorites being Captain Kronos, if you haven't seen that one. I like that great one, Great film, great yeah. film. Yeah. But yeah, Hammer films are a blast. Uh, yeah. A lot of fun to watch and perfect for this type of weather. Probably my favorite horror movie of all time is um, The Thing, the John Carpenter version. I think that movie's perfect, actually. Well, both the film that you're mentioning there, James, and also the Hammer films that uh, Jason's talking about, I could find an archaeological tie-in here because one of my favorite Hammer films is The Creeping Flesh, and that involves a mysterious discovery from the ancient past that is recovered. In your case, of course, there is the recovery of an ancient extraterrestrial embedded under the ice down there in Antarctica. I watched The Creeping Flesh about two weeks ago. Yeah. It's on Amazon, I think. <laughs> it's really a fun movie. Just don't get it wet. That is right. Well, you know, what else is fun, of course, in the spirit of archaeology in October? I mean, our first trip together up to Ohio, that wasn't the only state that we visited. We also went to Pennsylvania and made our very first trip to the famous Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. And that was sort of a formative experience for we three because we were very fortunate to be able to sit down with J.M. Adivasio, who is a legend in archaeology and who has been highly influential on the work of this team. And later in this episode, Dr. Adivasio joins us again for round two, the first time we have actually all collectively gotten together and spoken since we met at Meadowcroft years ago. And so it's going to be wonderful to catch up with Dr. Adivasio. Before we do that, of course, I do want to remind you, you can find us online and we are at sevenages.org, as well as on Instagram, on YouTube, on Twitter. Just look for Seven Ages Research. And if I understand correctly, I think that we keep getting those good reviews over there on Apple Podcasts. Do we not? We do indeed. And this week, I'd like to thank uh, Mark Steele, who has left us a five-star review uh, titled Real Archaeology Brought Home. Uh, Mark says, great show. The hosts do their work of spreading real archaeology in the face of all the made-up stuff out there in popular media. Parentheses, I'm not saying they're aliens, but real science in action. Great guests and hosts complement each other in background and personality. And cool intro song, too. So, Mark, thank you very much for taking a couple moments to write us that review. It's greatly appreciated. And, uh, yeah, if you have a few minutes and you enjoy the show, please drop us a review. It really helps get the podcast out to other people so that they can find our shows and our uh, content. Uh, very important that you do so. So, uh, again, follow us on all of our social media. And uh, also one more uh, kind of important thing is if your business is interested in advertising on the Seven Ages Audio Journal podcast, please contact me at jason at sevenages.org. I'd be happy to send you some information on advertising on the show. Uh, again, important for our research and uh, getting those funds up so that we can head back out to these great archaeological sites 
and hopefully meet some of you guys out there along the way. That is absolutely correct. Uh, we have a backlog of emails I've been meaning to get to. One of them, actually, a couple probably, from Mark Steele. And so I really need to get back to those. He'd taken the time to write a good lengthy email to me. And not only that, but Mark also sent along a donation to the program. He, as well as Edith Wacker and also Ron Catoriano. So thanks to all you guys who sent along donations. If you're interested in donating to the program, you can do that right over there at sevenages.org. There is a donation button. And of course, all contributions are most welcome. So, guys, without further ado, I think it's also time for us to welcome our guest in our second installment of our very special Legacy Series. It's been a long time coming, getting back behind the microphone with J.M. Adovasio. He is the author of books like Strangers in a New Land, some of the very most formative books for the Seven Ages Research Associates as we were first getting involved in Paleo-Indian archaeology and, more broadly speaking, trying to understand the ancient past throughout the Americas and the world for that matter. And J.M. Adovesio is certainly a respected expert around the world among his colleagues. And so it's about time for us to get into this legacy series discussion with Dr. Adovesio when we return right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Tonight, we are delighted to be joined again by a icon in the field of American archaeology. J.M. Adovesio received his undergraduate degree in anthropology from the University of Arizona in 1965 and his Ph.D. in anthropology from the University of Utah in 1970. Now, since that time, he has served as a postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian Institution between 1972 and 1973, and as professor and chairman of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Pittsburgh from 1973 up until 1990. In more recent years, he has served as the co-principal investigator of a multi-year NOAA-sponsored project to locate and excavate submerged Paleo-Indian sites on the inundated continental shelf of the Gulf of Mexico. Now, although he is probably best known for his state-of-the-art excavations at Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in southwestern Pennsylvania and its relationship to the pre-Clovis versus Clovis first debate, Adovasio is generally considered to be the world's leading authority in the arena of perishable artifact analysis. Since 1970, he has published books, book chapters, manuscripts, and technical papers numbering more than 400 in total. These notably include The Invisible Sex with Olga Soffer and Jake Page. He is also author of Strangers in a New Land, What Archaeology Reveals About the First Americans, which is one of the most visually appealing and arguably simply one of the finest books on Paleo-Indian archaeology in the Americas. And so without further ado, it is our pleasure to welcome back to the Seven Ages Audio Journal, Dr. J.M. Adovasio, and thank you for being here with us. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, as I was previously. Indeed. It's always good to catch up, and I hope, again, in these strange times, uh, that we find you and yours doing well. Yes, we're, we're thriving here in western New York. I mean, our closest neighbors, as I indicated to you previously, are cows, and they don't carry the virus right. or wear masks, for that matter. Well, during such uncertain times, I suppose you could have far worse neighbors. With that, uh, Jason, I think I'll turn it over to you as we lead things off. Well, as we begin this uh, second installment of our Legacy Series, uh, we're very proud to have you, Dr. Adivazio. Uh The work that you've done is reflective of an immaculate career, uh, so many high points uh, to discuss here tonight. So we're, we're very happy. Being that we're going to cover your career here tonight, I want to start there. So your earliest influence, who was your mother and, and how she began to put you on the path to archaeology and anthropology? My mother was a second-generation Ukrainian immigrant. We spoke Ukrainian at home when I was a child, because my grandmother thought English was a barbaric tongue and refused to use it, even if she understood it. 
consequently, uh, I've always had a facility for multiple languages on account of that, that childhood experience. And on top of that, my mother was the first person in her family to go to college. She went to Marietta College. She was a, a multiple major, among which was history and several languages and chemistry. And she was a multiple sport athlete as well. And from the time I was literally capable of movement, she began to teach me how to read using geology and anthropology books. And I was essentially programmed to be an archaeologist from the very beginning and has been one ever since, obviously. I never wanted to do anything else. So coming from that viewpoint of someone who was so um, influential as far as your career path would end up being a lifetime of archaeology and anthropology, uh, what was your childhood like uh, as far as uh, where you grew up? Uh, were you exposed to archaeological sites? Were you uh, taking part in any excavations at that time? What was your general childhood like revolving around anthropology? Well, interestingly enough, I, I was from Youngstown, Ohio, formerly the crime capital of the upper Midwest, and uh, also the place where, as I believe it to be true, car bombs were actually invented there back in the 20s. But in any case, uh, my my exposure to cultural anthropology was the diverse backgrounds of the people around me that I knew, both my own relatives and others. Uh, all of the archaeology experiences that I had really didn't begin until I went off to college, so that it was essentially textbook-based learning, not only in archaeology, but in geology and other areas as well. Well, you said being from Ohio, so Ohio Valley, that whole area is obviously known for the mound building culture, the Adena, the Hopewell, uh, such a rich uh, tapestry of different cultures in that area. Did that have any influence on you at all as a child being exposed to those sites? Well, I certainly was aware of those, those entities, and my mother would take me on trips to visit not only historic sites, but archaeological sites as well. So I was more thoroughly aware of those phenomena, some of the cultures you named, before I was in the sixth grade than I think most people are. I'm not sure how much of an influence the exposure to those sites may have had upon me, but in any case, they provided an adjunct to the information that my mother was supplying. Also, since my mother was a widow who's my father was killed in World War II and she never remarried. Consequently, she oddly enough became a Dominican nun and I was raised outside the convent by somebody with very strict values and a very highly evolved work ethic. That certainly has carried over into my contemporary life because she was a solitary parent. She was concerned that there would be a male influence in my life. And so when I was very young, she shipped me off to live with my father's brother in Mexico, where I simultaneously picked up Spanish and also was exposed to a different culture early on in my existence, so to speak. And all that before, basically, I was in the sixth grade. Such a diverse array of influences early on. I'm sure that that must have carried over into your college years as well, Doctor. And maybe we could talk a little about that, your beginnings there at the University of Arizona and thereafter doctoral studies there at the University of Utah. Well, what was interesting about Arizona was at that time, Emil Howery was still alive and obviously a salient figure in the history of the field certainly one of the primary figures in the history of Southwestern archaeology. And I took classes from him and others as well. And Vance Haynes was beginning his teaching career at that particular moment in time. And so from a very early age, I was exposed to the idea that 
the earliest populations in the New World were makers of Clovis fluted projectile points, and I had no reason not to believe that. And consequently, uh, I did, in fact, subscribe to that notion. Early on in the game, I wanted to be an Egyptologist and not a North American prehistorian. And I ended up going to the University of Utah on an NDEA Title IV scholarship in order to work with the late Jesse D. Jennings, who was not for nothing called the Dark Lord of the Desert. And from him, I learned that properly executed archaeology requires not only a, a firm grasp of how geology operates and how sites come to be both before, during, and after a human presence, but also the fact he was fortunate enough to be a recipient of numerous grants. And so the way he did archaeology, the interdisciplinary way he did performed archaeology certainly rubbed off on me and all of my contemporaries at that time. His attention to detail for the time was meticulous, and he was, as most of you know, a very harsh master, so to speak, and consequently it was a unique educational experience, I'll put it that way. That's a good way to put it. I'd been interested for a while. In fact, ever since the first time that we spoke with you about that nickname Jennings had, uh, you referred to him as the Dark Lord. Since, of course, I've done a lot of research on the gentleman, but he was known for uh, a certain specificity and for cleanliness in his excavations. Uh, maybe you could talk a little about that and that experience with him. Well, he... He believed that not only should excavations be done with the highest standards possible and had the wherewithal to have the requisite equipment to do it the proper way, he was also well tied into interdisciplinary scholars who were used to working with archaeologists and could bring to bear some of the best in their respective disciplines that, that there were, and of course all that uh, carried off or, or was translated to its students. Uh, he, he had very little toleration for, he brooked fools poorly. And his level of scorn and abuse for those whom he considered to be not performing as well as they could was considerable, but I'll put it that way. Certainly. And he made it very clear that if any of us, that my fellow students or myself did not perform up to his expectations, you'd know about it immediately. And uh, you did know about it. <laughs> He, he left nothing to the imagination. So, yeah, I, <laughs> so it sounds like his his uh, his name, his nickname was uh, well earned, to say the least. Um, I, I do want to back up for just one second because you did mention something there that I think uh, I've never heard about your career before, and I find it really interesting when you said that your original intention was to be an Egyptologist. So uh, I do want to back up to that. Where did that fascination come from, and how did you end up where you're at versus Egyptology? Well, some of the earliest books that my mother gave me to learn how to read were, in fact, archaeology books about Egypt. And I think the average person who is interested in archaeology has a fascination with classical civilizations generally. And in this particular instance, since it was situated in a desert environment, basically the Nile Valley being the only exception to what is otherwise a desert environment, I, I found fascinating that a civilization could emerge in those sets of circumstances. And I was interested in the rise of state-level societies, much as Tom Dillahay was interested early on in the rise of state-level societies in South America. 
I was interested in the processes by which state level societies come into being and thought that would be a way to pursue my archaeological interests. Very quickly, it became apparent that Egyptology in most U.S. schools is taught within a classics uh, perspective, and they don't, most of them don't necessarily do archaeology the same way that anthropologically trained archaeologists do things with their emphasis on on history, philology, and so forth, they simply have a different take on the past, or had, I should say, a different take on the past than, than I might have had. And as a result, I ended up pursuing North American prehistory because it enabled me to not only study desert environments, but hunter-gatherer populations in those kind of environments that was the specialty at the University of Utah. Yeah. Now, that being the specialty there at the University of Utah, again, we often place emphasis when we talk about hunter-gatherer societies on the hunting aspect. And, of course, this has a lot to do with the fact that there are non-perishable technologies that are readily available for study, stone tools, the lithic tool industries from over the ages. The far less often discussed side has to do with gathering and, of course, the methods by which things were gathered and carried. This, of course, brings us to basketry. And this happens to be something that you are an expert in. So I gather that this interest and this expertise probably stems back to your time in Utah, right? Well, it does. When I originally arrived there, they had just gotten done completing the excavations of Hog Up Cave, which is a, an archaic site with a very long sequence of human occupation that begins about 7,000 or so years before the common era and lasts until after AD 1000. And so it's a very long sequence. And from that, they recovered a vast amount of perishable material, a lot of, a lot of baskets, a lot of cords, a lot of other things And since there was no one at the university at the time who analyzed these things, Jennings suggested that I might wish to acquaint myself with these things or else I could pursue my education somewhere else. So I came to know and love baskets dearly and have probably seen more of those things than anyone who ever lived for whatever that's worth. But I pursued a parallel career, much less contentious than the Clovis pre-Clovis side of my career in perishable analysis, where you can literally say anything about these things. And the normal reaction is, well, that's nice. So that if, if I were to tell you that I have worked with Roman materials made out of lark's tongues, you'd go, oh, that's nice. (laughs) <laughs> you might find it a, a, a might peculiar, but other than that, the U.S. reaction of most archaeologists to non-stone technology is that it's nice, but, and of course, we inherited as scholars the emphasis on stone tools from developments in Europe 150 plus years ago, and It has always been the contention of most archaeologists that the be-all and end-all of Ice Age lifeways has been stone. And that's largely preservational, and it's largely due to the fact that what is more dramatic for an academic than to sit around some faculty club sucking down pork and sherry and thinking about what their great ancestors did in the remote past with stone tools. I mean, it's exciting. And making a basket and stalking the wild carrot is not very exciting. Right. But, you know, Dr. Adavazio, there's this side of this, too, where uh, it becomes a very materialistic sort of argument. Well, show me the evidence. You know, I'll believe it when I see it. And, of course, no one would dispute the fact that the very dominant sense that humans possess, of course, is sight. And so often, maybe second to that touch, if we can feel something, and of course, stone tools being non-perishable, you can look at them, you can turn them in your hands, you can see them. 
And it kind of shows a short-sightedness and, frankly, a shallowness that people fail to observe the significance of the more perishable technologies. When we look at our homes around us, are our homes built of stone? No, they're built out of wood and things that if there's not proper maintenance and upkeep, these things, too, will fall back to dust. They will return. So certainly you, of course, are getting a different perspective of the human past by focusing on that sort of shadow of what once was and what what has been lost to time. Well, consider what you guys are wearing right now. With the exception of your glasses, your headsets, rings if you have any, belt buckles if you're wearing a belt, nothing you're wearing would be preserved in a normal environmental situation. You know, in a year or two, they would be gone totally. Unless you're wearing some kind of, you know, durable synthetic. That, that might be different. But if you're wearing anything natural made out of cotton or some organic material, it'll be gone. Also consider the fact that 90% or more of the technology of hunter-gatherers in all environments, whether it's the far north or tropical rainforests or deserts, is non-durable. It's made out of wood. It's made out of leather. It's made out of anything but stone. And consequently, When you see these ethnographic populations relying so heavily on non-durable technology, it's it's a wonder, and it's preservational, and it's obviously there's a bias there because since non-durable technology is normally associated with females, there's, there's clearly a male bias operational here in which You ignore all those things that groups make made out of things that aren't made out of stone. Yes. And that's such an interesting point, by the way, because later in the conversation, we are going to talk about that, you know, male dominated bias and some of the great work you've done to try and uproot that paradigm. First, we should mention the fact that, of course, after your doctoral work in Utah, you then go to the Smithsonian where you conducted postdoctoral work. Is that correct? I went to look at, yes, more baskets. And my dissertation was, of course, on basketry. And what I was trying to study at the Smithsonian, although I was diverted early on into another pursuit, but I was trying to look at ethnographic basketry from the Great Basin that was associated largely with the Numic speakers to see when the contemporary industries, by that I mean industries that are post-AD 1000 for the most part, when they came into being and how different they were than what was there before as part of understanding the spread of the so-called numic speakers, the Utes, the Paiutes, and their relatives. Uh, When I got to the Smithsonian, they had extensive collections, of course, of ethnographic material, but I was asked to reanalyze some of Walt Taylor's material from northern Mexico, which was excavated in the 1940s, and which contains some of the earliest perishable material from northern Mexico. And so I ended up working with it more extensively than I ended up looking at what I was there to study. Let's talk about that for a second, because we... Again, we just had this conversation about the stone implements, but when we get to the basketry, the cordage, as far as the narrative goes of early peoples of America or early peoples in general for that that uh, purpose, what are we missing by not examining or having specimens of, of cordage and basketry to examine? What can we learn from the various styles that we find? So if you're looking at that northern Mexico, uh, those examples, what are we seeing there? Well, the adaptations that those desertic dwelling populations had would have been impossible without non-durable technology. The baskets that they used to carry, to process food, to cook food, would have, if they didn't have them, they could not have lived there. And their possession of sophisticated stone tools, unfortunately, would have made little difference to their success in that area, just as it would not be that critical in a, in a jungle situation or in a tundra situation. Stop to consider how groups supposedly got to Australia. 
uh, in the in the early days, they were supposedly blown there by accident. That was part of the bias, the white bias about Australian Aborigines not having the capacity to actually construct rafts and sail over the horizon. But forgetting that for a moment, you could not build a boat or a seagoing raft without perishable material. It, it simply can't be done. The boat itself is a perishable item. And consequently, the island could have never been colonized without non-durable technology. Just as I think the people of the New World could not have happened without non-durable technology. Yeah, the case seems to be strengthened with every passing year that there was in likelihood a aqueous component. The watercraft probably played a role, even given consideration to a you know Beringian land bridge, uh, it would have been likely and perhaps even more efficient for ancient people to travel along the coastlines. And so the contention has been raised more than once that, yeah, that probably would have involved uh, sailing vessels. Dr. Adivasio, let's uh, maybe move over to a little discussion now about Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. This is the site for which you are best known. And, of course, it is a groundbreaking instance in archaeology where a paradigm shift was well underway and was being influenced heavily by the work you were doing there. This story begins in the early 1970s. Why don't you tell us about what led you to Meadowcroft Rock Shelter? I had research commitments on the island of Cyprus at the time I was hired by the University of Pittsburgh. And part of that job description was to resurrect the temporarily defunct archaeological research program in western Pennsylvania. To that end, and because I was committed to working on Cyprus, I circulated word amongst my colleagues in western Pennsylvania that we were looking for a place that had at least one rock shelter in it, because these are the kinds of sites I'd worked with most extensively in Utah. They also serve as magnets for repeated human visitation, by the way. Right. They're part of what's usually called the marked landscape that everybody knows where they're going to be in any environmental situation. But in any case, I, I got word from the late Phil Jack, who was a historian at California State College, about a rock shelter since named Meadowcroft on the property of the Miller family and went to see it in the spring of 1973, and it sort of took off from there. We solicited permission from the Meadowcroft Foundation to begin work there, and from the very beginning, the, the purpose of the project was to, in effect, uh, train students, not just in archaeology, but in, in related fields, about state-of-the-art protocols in their respective disciplines. It was never our intention to find anything particularly early. It was all, always our intention to do things as well as they could possibly be done, given the fact that we had unusually, I'm the first to admit, lots of money from the very beginning so that if we were aware of a particular instrument or a particular protocol or a particular way of doing things, we could go out and buy it or get somebody that knew how to do that. And consequently, it was always like an outdoor laboratory more than it was like an archaeological site that it turned out to be old on top of exhibiting a very long occupational sequence was part of a cake that we never intended to bake. It was icing on a cake that we never were expecting to find, so to speak. When we first visited Menocroft, I had never been uh, in that part of the country before, but I realized that that Pennsylvania age uh, sandstone that basically comprises uh, Meadowcroft, it's very common to the, down the East coast into the uh, uh, South central part of the country. And I realized that there's potentially thousands of metal crofts out there in valleys all through the United States. But my question is, is knowing what you know now from the information gathered at Metalcroft, would it 
Would you expect to learn much more from excavating a similar place? I mean, would it be worth doing? Oh, yeah, it, it would definitely be worth doing if, if only from the standpoint of providing corroborative information about long-term human use of those kinds of sites. Uh, I'm sure there, there probably are, as you indicated, uh, an abundance of rock shelters and overhangs beneath which people dwelt episodically or periodically over the last 10, 12, 15, 18,000 years. But finding them on purpose is a very difficult thing to do. As Tom Dillahay explained to you, he learned about Monteverdi almost by accident. I learned about Meadowcroft from a historian. And the historian who told me about it, of course, never suspected there would be an early human presence there. So these very early sites, until quite recently, were simply for the most part, accidentally stumbled upon. And it it is really the case that a rancher, a farmer, knows more about the sites that may be on his or her property than any archaeologist usually knows about a similar expanse of terrain. Yes. With regard to Meadowcroft, part of what has made it such a landmark in modern archaeology, of course, is what was discovered there, but also the state-of-the-art application of processes, procedures, and analysis as excavations were underway. Dr. Adavazio, maybe you could explain that aspect of what made this such an important excavation, how you actually proceeded, the meticulous nature of it. I suspect maybe there was a bit of Jennings' influence there, and how this also revealed more about this site even regardless of what you found there? Well, as I indicated, we always had an abundance of money. Initially from the Meadowcroft Foundation, the University of Pittsburgh, subsequently from a bunch of Pittsburgh-based foundations, the National Geographic Society, and, and many, many other sources. And so one of the first things we, we were worried about was what would happen to the site during the non-excavation season and how would we work during inclement weather. So we erected the first of what would become a series of structures over the site so we could basically work indoors. It was critical to be able to see appropriately, and so we had Westinghouse engineers University of Pittsburgh electrical engineers design a lighting system for the rock shelter that allowed us to control the hue intensity and chroma of the lights so that you could bring up or mute various aspects of the natural stratigraphy to make it easier for students to work. We also could torture students way more then than you can now. And so we mandated not only that the field school would take months and months and months, but you had to repetitively take it so that we had the same people year in and year out who developed a very intimate familiarity with all the properties of that site. And it was the combination of being aware that you can ask all the big questions as you guys do in archaeology, the whys and so forth, But unless you do the who, what, where, when stuff meticulously, you can't do the how stuff. And if you can't do the how stuff, you sure as hell can't do the why stuff. And what we were trying to do was to make sure that when the students were done there, they knew exactly how, as it were, to collect data and employ that data in a judicious fashion to exercise maximal control over the temporal placement of every single thing that we found. And yes, that is directly inherited from Jennings, who insisted on the same thing. We added our own nuances to that because, for instance, we installed a computer terminal that was connected, a Tektronix graphics terminal that was connected to the mainframe at the University of Pittsburgh, 
by a modem, by a phone that was in the rock shelter. In fact, on one occasion, I called Jennings to invite him to visit the site, and he said, do you have a, and we'll forget the adjective, (laughs) phone in that place? And I said, yes. He said, I don't want to go there. There shouldn't be phones in rock shelters. In any case, he was being facetious. But the point is that on another occasion, we converted a Coulter blood counter that was used to count red blood cells to measuring clay-sized sediment so we could process sediment samples much, much faster than you could do with pipettes. And so consequently... That was an expensive proposition, and it paid off in the end, and so did most of the other things we attempted to do. But the point is that the emphasis was always on doing things, on teaching people the appropriate way to collect data. And that aspect of the work has never been criticized by anybody. Uh, It's... Unfortunately, some of the things that we found in some of the deeper units that have been the bones of contention, not how they were discovered. Right. We'll get to those critiques in a moment, too, because that debate, to some extent, maybe less so than in previous years, but it still wages even today. But on the subject of learning and education, your students, I'm certain, left a circumstance like that with an extensive knowledge of the excavation process. But you as the lead excavator, as the educator. Dr. Adavazio, what did you learn from Meadowcroft Rock Shelter? Well, a a lot of things. For instance, you learn the limits, if you will, of not only yourself and your ability to perceive a complicated depositional setting like that. You learn how much you can rightfully expect a student to pick up on to use very bad English. And consequently, I think it was a learning experience for me from the very beginning to the very end, and there is no end yet, because we returned to the site in the 80s, the 90s, and most recently a few years ago, as you know. And we're still collecting data from that rock shelter using modern data collection and analytical techniques that we have become aware of. And I think that when you treat archaeology as if it was a cookbook operation and you could learn a recipe and do it that way forever, you don't learn that it's a fluid field. You don't learn that there are things that you constantly incorporate into the enterprise that will help you learn more about the Aboriginal inhabitants of that particular locality. And uh, as we get a little bit deeper into the conversation concerning Meadowcroft, uh, I I want to return one more minute to uh, the excavation itself, because, again, this is something that, having seen it in person, um, at least, you know, post-excavation, seeing that Meadowcroft, the way that it's presented today when you can go there and visit, uh, it's absolutely astonishing, uh, the amount of depth. And so my question to you is, so that the listeners fully understand exactly what happened there at the rock shelter, uh, what is the depth of the excavation? How many horizons did you go through? I mean, the way that it's tagged, it's it's absolutely incredible. Well, there, there are 11 natural strata at the site, and the maximum thickness is near the eastern rock fall, near the north wall of the site. It's about 16 feet deep there. And what is represented is an accumulation of of short-term depositional and occupational events in which people camped for very brief periods of time, left whatever it is they were going to leave, and then that material was rather swiftly covered up so that you could focus, if you could separate those occupational episodes on very minute moments in the past. And I think the greatest amount of satisfaction we get out of the site is the fact that 
you can study the nuances of thousands of years of a human presence against an ever subtly changing background of plant and animal communities and climatic situations in ways that you can't do anywhere else. And I think that it turned out to begin far earlier than we imagined is only a small part of the overall picture. Looking at the the way that you're describing those, those strata and those layers, uh, from your interpretation, are we looking at at any point during the excavation, are you seeing long-term habitation continuous there? Or are we seeing uh, large breaks in time? Or are we looking at the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter as essentially the holiday inn of the past? Well, consider, consider this. You guys are seated right now in parts of your respective houses, offices, or wherever that you might not use all the time. There are parts of your house that are vacant right now or are being used by pets or other family members or what have you. And the same is true with the rock shelter. There are parts of it that are used more intensively than other parts. The major occupation there seems to occur in the fall of the year by very small groups. And they're there for a very brief period of time, and then they move on. And so what we have is a series of episodic visits, very limited in scope and scale, that might have been more intense at particular time periods, but were never year-round or even close to it, that were entirely dependent on the collection of wild plant and animal foods and the meager amount of domesticates they may have had exposure to. Dr. Adavasio, also with regard to what turns up in Meadowcroft Rock Shelter and the evidences of human habitation from the past, there are a couple of interesting questions that I've had on my mind since the last time we spoke, and actually one of which we touched on when we spoke with you. Um, These have to do with fragmentary portions of possible early basketry recovered from Meadowcroft, and of course this being your area of study, who better to ask about this than you? Now, one of these, uh, according to the calibrated radiocarbon dates, appear to be as recent as 16,688 calendar years B.C. or as early as 31,329. In the past, you clarified for me that going with the more conservative estimates with the plus or minus brings us roughly right. to contemporaneous with about the period that we attribute to the miller Lancelot. Is that correct? That, yeah, more or less. I mean, essentially, we think that there are people visiting the site by 16,000 calendar years ago. And we think that they are migratory, you know, plant and animal collectors, broad spectrum forager types. And that's the case there ever after, all the way up until and after the appearance of domesticates in surrounding areas. So, The basic function of the rock shelter never changes. Whether they foray out from villages to it later in time or if they go there from seasonal camps later in time or if they simply visit it episodically earlier in time, its basic use as a collection site never stops. Yes. I have a slightly technical question that I would like to ask, which sort of contrasts the discoveries at Meadowcroft with more recent archaeological discoveries, which I think is important to do sometimes if we do so cautiously. More recent discoveries at locations like Chiquehuite Cave in Mexico's Astillero Mountains, which actually led to the discovery of more than 200 stone tools believed to be in sediment layers, radiocarbon dated between 25,000 and 32,000 years old, do suggest an earlier human presence in the Americas. Now, in light of that, and this, of course, remains controversial, many say that's just far too far back. But in your opinion, when we look at some of the calendar dates that may be attributable to certain radiocarbon datable materials recovered from Meadowcroft, do any of them bespeak earlier dates, which at the time you would have looked at and said, well, you know, that's far too far out there. But in light of more recent discoveries, you have looked at and given further consideration to, or do you prefer not to do that at all? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. I think if you realize that a hundred years ago or so, we didn't believe anybody was here in the new world during the last ice age at all. 
And it was not until the validation of the Folsom discoveries and then subsequently the excavations at Blackwater Draw Locality Number 3, that when the, when the first Clovis stuff was found in context, that we began to appreciate the fact that there not only were Ice Age populations here, but that because of the bias that we'd inherited, that these earliest populations were in fact dependent on rapidly moving groups of predominantly male hunters chasing big game animals that would subsequently, they would drive to extinction. Uh, Even when that model was and it still is in certain circles, as you indicated, still in in force. The idea that there could be a site like the one in Mexico, or there could be a place like Meadowcroft, or there could be a place like Mono Verde that reflected different adaptations or or non big game hunting focused adaptations was totally unheard of. And in, in light of the changing ideas that we've had about how people view the past and what people might have been doing in the earliest arrivals here, I have never seen any of these other locations which have caused us to reevaluate necessarily any of the early Meadowcroft data from the standpoint of saying, well, it could be this old, but it, for whatever reason, probably isn't. Any more than Tom at Monteverdi, who has clearly earlier material nearby, uh, would be inclined to say that his 30,000 or 29,000-year-old material is necessarily valid just because someone in Mexico may have earlier dates. Certainly. So I'm going to switch gears just a little bit because what you were just talking about jogged a, a memory of mine when we visited Meadowcroft, there's, if you go there and go on the tour, there's a, oftentimes there's a presentation afterwards. And one of the things that really, really stuck with me from the presentation was that the idea, as you mentioned just a few minutes ago, of these primarily male bands of hunters sweeping down across the continent and murdering all of the uh, megafauna with spears as is often portrayed, you know, in, in popular culture may not be the most practical way to uh, go about gathering uh, food for, for those people. Uh, and that they may have hunted and most likely hunted much smaller game with much different uh, uh, tactics. Well, you know, consider where this idea started in, in the Europe of the late 1700s and early 1800s, when Europeans began to be interested in who were the first Spaniards, who were the first French, who were the first Germans, who were the first English, and so on, and what did they do, you had 99% of those people that were interested in that phenomenon, or those phenomena, were men, and some of them, or all of them, were amateurs in one field or another. One of them, Jacques Boucher, Crivecourt de Perth, working on the banks of the Somme River, excavated a series of paleontological specimens intercalated with which there were stone tools. And at once, it was evident that these stone tools were very ancient. They belonged to a time when, allegedly, males using those stone tools wielded them to kill and disarticulate now extinct animals. They didn't know when that occurred. They knew it was a long time back. But that was the birth of the idea of man the hunter. In a very similar way, the excavations at Folsom or the excavations at Clovis in New Mexico and other sites seemed to document a reliance on now extinct Pleistocene big game animals. And the first site in the New World where this was actually claimed to be the case that was given any credence was at Vero in Florida. Even before Vero was a recognized city, the excavations that Frank Sellards, the state geologist, conducted there were such that the alleged association of humans and Ice Age fauna was taken to be earth-shattering 
in much the same way that the excavations that we conducted finding allegedly early material were likewise different than the paradigm that obtained at the time because they seemed to demonstrate early humans doing what early humans were not supposed to be doing. They weren't even supposed to be here. And likewise, at places like Cactus Hill in Virginia, uh, Galt in, or Deborah L. Friedkin in Galt in Texas, uh, sites in the far west and elsewhere, it looks like some of these early populations, like modern hunter-gatherers, are broad-spectrum hunters that will eat anything, just like, as I pointed out, college students have anything in their refrigerator that will fit. Good comparison. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, kind of sticking with this for a moment, um, yeah, I mean, certainly there's there's controversial aspects to all of the peopling of America, that's for sure. I want to talk about briefly for uh, the next couple minutes the term pre-Clovis. And uh, the reason I want to get into this is because even today in 2020, it's a controversial term in that there's still a strong group of proponents that don't necessarily adhere to any pre-Clovis presence. So I've heard it described as rather than a pre-Clovis, meaning someone that was here before fluted spear points that we attribute to that technology, um, the earliest, and I've heard Meadowcroft mentioned by other researchers in this regard, the earliest uh, indicators across the continent were that rather than being a pre-Clovis people, we're looking at the very beginnings of a Clovis spread across the continent, if you will. So rather than being pre-Clovis, it's the very earliest impl implements of Clovis. Where are we at with pre-Clovis in 2020? That That's certainly, what you say is certainly possible. In other words, the people who first visited Meadowcroft probably could have been, or not, not probably, may have been, ancestral to fluted point makers. By the same token, the people that visited Monteverde clearly weren't. That's a different population. So I think what we're looking at is waves of populations with possibly different genetic profiles, different linguistic profiles, albeit from Northeastern Asia or Eastern Asia generally, arriving here in a variety of ways, but well before the diffusion and spread of Clovis fluted projectile points. Now, whether or not any of the individual populations were in fact directly genetically ancestral to Clovis, I have no idea. I do know that between 1933, the excavations at Blackwater Draw, and the early 1970s, probably 500 archaeological sites in North and South America were alleged to be older than Clovis or older than fluted points. And they, they all had a very similar trajectory. You'd read about them in your local newspaper. Then you'd read about them in a scientific journal, along with the caveats that something was probably wrong with the dates, the artifacts, the stratigraphy, or whatever. Each time one of these 500 sites enjoyed its Warhol-esque 15 minutes of fame and disappeared from the radar screen, it reinforced the Clovis model so that what makes Meadowcroft unique, I think, is the fact that it was the first very serious challenge to the pre-existing model, just like Vero was the first serious challenge to the idea that there was no people here, there were no people here during the last ice age. Right. And I think, I think until the Multiverde ex excavations occurred, until some of these other sites have appeared that are clearly older than Clovis, whatever you want to call it, the idea that any of them could be older than Clovis became questionable. And you see all sorts of, I, I don't mean this negatively, spear carriers of the old faith 
the old Clovis first idea becoming particularly vocal and vitriolic right now as that model collapses, which is exactly what Kuhn said happens in his structure of scientific revolutions. It doesn't matter what field you're in. If somebody came along and told you there was a better way to make podcasts, you'd probably say, well, you blithering quack. That's right. It's not true. (laughs) But, Somebody will do that at some point. Yes, they will. And the reaction of you guys will become more incensed unless you change your minds, confronted with alternative data. And many have changed their minds about the pre-Clovis-Clovis Clovis issue. There will always be a subset of folks who will never change their minds, never. And they will die in transigence. And... I pointed that out previously. For those folk, there there is no pre-Clovis and never will be, no matter what. You know, Dr. Adavazio, for me, so much of this has to do with philosophy, not only of science, but also philosophy of language. People get so caught up in interpretation of the terminology. You know, again, looking at Clovis as being some kind of, it is certainly a model, but again, it means different things to different people with different approaches. For some, it is a culture. For some, it is a lithic type. And if we look at the lithic type separate from the idea of culture, it really seems to sort of reconcile the problem in the sense that we identify this cultural manifestation, but then if we look at the lithic technology as being only evidence of one stage in the development of that culture, it sort of resolves the problem of there being an earlier presence, does it not? Well, if if you look at fluting of projectile points as the first indication of a human presence in the new world, as well as the representation, the icon of a lifestyle that is built around a particular strategy for pursuing big game, then there were clearly people here earlier doing other things. And in that sense, it doesn't matter what you call it. I know that uh, some scholars in Texas favor the idea of calling these earlier than Clovis manifestations earlier than Clovis. Others call them pre-Clovis or whatever. As you say, if if you restrict it just to fluting, then it has a very limited radiocarbon range. And within that limited radiocarbon range, it there are places in South America in particular where fluting never penetrates. And in these areas, it is an unrelated contemporaneous complex that cannot possibly be descended from Clovis. And yet, what was our reaction when Europeans said this or when South Americans said this? The U.S. and Canadian reaction was, those guys on the other side of the Atlantic have no idea what they're talking about. Those guys in South America don't even speak English. And so we ignored it when, in fact, we should have seen the flaws in the model way back when. Yeah, I'm glad you, by the way, mentioned some of the pushback that we see from across the pond, although many of them are actually even more welcoming to the idea of there being an earlier presence in the Americas. But Felipe Fernandez Armesto, the eminent historian in Europe, of course, speaks very highly of your work, and he often references you in his own writings, which I was very uh, both impressed and also very glad to see. And I'm sure one reason why historians around the world would look at your work and would have such uh, such a fascination and also appreciation for it, Dr. Adavazio, has to do with the way that you look between the lines and even outside the lines where none are existent. In your book, The Invisible Sex, you went deeply into looking at the role of women in the archaeological record, which is so often overlooked. May we discuss that? Sure. I think because of some of the historical processes we've talked about, the fact that, I mean, here we have, here you are, three gentlemen conducting this interview. Uh, we, we have, for a very long period of time, 
lived in societies in which many of the critical roles have been played by males. We have assumed, male scholars have assumed in the past that was also the case. And so we attribute a a paramountcy to male activity in the past that simply is an illusion or a delusion, more accurately, because without the complementary role of females in every aspect of technology and every aspect of adaptation, we would not have succeeded as a species. I'm not talking about reproductively. We would not have survived culturally right. because most of what they made, used, and did, guys didn't make, use, or do. And consequently, if they only, meaning we only, males only, had stone tools upon which to rely, we'd never be having this discussion. Yes. That's one of the things about your work that I think is so important. We have to look beyond, even sometimes within an existing paradigm, we have to look beyond our own expectations and limited worldview, and especially beyond the physical remains that are right there in front of us. Often what has not lasted through the centuries tells a much deeper story. Now, case in point, you mentioned earlier state-of-the-art technological applications being instituted for further study at Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. I believe this includes the potential extraction of environmental DNA, does it not? Recently, one of Eski Willersleeve's students, one of uh, Dave Meltzer's students also, called us and asked if he could collect sediments from Meadowcroft in order to attempt to find uh, eDNA, environmental DNA, which bonds to sediment particles in a particular way. And while the results of that work are only preliminary at this point, it appears that there is DNA preserved there and that it represents a variety of still living and possibly extinct species. And it's another example of what I talked to you about in terms of trying to employ some of the very latest developments to learn something new about a location. I mean, we weren't using it, for instance, to demonstrate that humans might have been there at a particular point in time, but merely to find out if in that kind of an environmental setting, DNA was preserved at all. I had a hypothetical question, and you're under no obligation to answer this or even acknowledge that I asked you, but if you had to finish the sentence, hypothetically, I would not be surprised if the peopling of the Americas occurred at this date, as early as fill in the blank. I would would say on either side of the last glacial maximum, they could have come say, after 30, or they could have come 19, 20, 21, thereabouts, after the last glacial maximum. I think human movement during the last glacial maximum would have been a little tough, but I think before before or after that point, they could have gotten here. And I would say 30 is a reasonable date because and this is very imperfect evidence, the earliest firm data from Siberia seems to suggest those kind of dates. Yeah, and you know, every year we're, we're again, gaining more and more data, uh, whether it be DNA, we're seeing the movement of the people. Uh, But getting back to your career in archaeology as a whole, we've mentioned Vero several times, and I certainly don't want to uh, skip over that. So if we could... Um, let's talk a bit about the importance of the Vero site, your role in that as principal investigator. Um, we know that Andy Hemmings, uh, Dr. Andy Hemmings, was the uh, lead archaeologist. So um, along with yourself and Jay Gamble, tell us about the role and the importance of the Vero site and what role you played there. Well, the, this is a longer and more convoluted answer than you probably want or need, but During one of our dives into the Gulf of Mexico, trying to explore the submerged landscape on the west coast of Florida, Andy Hemmings 
told me that he had been approached by a citizens group in Vero who were desirous of finding out whether or not Sellard's claims of 100 years ago were in fact accurate. And because he had had limited experience with terrestrial sites, limited access to excavation equipment, limited access to students, he asked whether or not I would care to become involved in this enterprise. And so I and Andy basically co-directed that project from 2014 to 2017. And during this pandemic, to tie into one of your earlier questions, I have, in fact, along with Andy, been working on the final volume of those excavations, which we will be submitting at the end of this month to the University of Florida Press. Excellent. Because that's a natural outlet for a project. Again, it was important in a hundred years ago because it was the first serious challenge to the idea that humans were here during the last ice age at all. As it turns out, Sellards was correct in the broader sense of the term. We were here during the last ice age, but not at the Vero locality. We think the information from there suggests later burials, as was suggested originally by Herdlitschka, one of the site's critics, and later on by others, that middle archaic or late early archaic burials, in fact, intruded into a level that contained Ice Age bones, so it looked like they were contemporaneous when, in fact, they weren't. And that's what we discovered. We found evidence that there were subaqueous burials there as at Windover and Republic Groves and places like that, but that with one very tentative suggestion, there is no conclusive evidence of an earlier human presence there at all. So Vero was important from the standpoint of looking at an old site and a legacy collection again using modern techniques and modern technology and arriving at a conclusion rather different, not only than the sponsors suggested it would be, but that the excavator at the time, Sellard, suggested it would be. And I think the the net result of the work has been not just to demonstrate that this burial complex, this subaqueous burial complex was widely distributed, much more widely distributed in Florida than we imagined, but that it is productive to look at old sites again and differently than, than one might have looked at them 100 years ago. Now, will that ever happen with Meadowcroft Rock Shelter? That's a good question. Uh, I, I assume that its current owners the John Hines History Center, will continue to have tours and visits there for the foreseeable future. Whether or not any additional excavations are done will be entirely up to them. I won't be on the scene anymore, so to speak. So as we, again, are are doing that broad spectrum look at your career, you mentioned Wendover. And, you know, for those who aren't up to speed on Wendover, it's a, a site, a subaqueous site in Titusville, Florida, um, with some remarkable preservation that was discovered there. Your role, again, as a uh, basketry cordage expert, uh, you were called in to work on that, and there was some really astounding, as I was researching uh, that site, there was some truly astounding pieces found there. Uh, describe your role and what exactly was found as far as the organic materials. Well, there's more than 170 burials there, which, first of all, suggests that the population that occupied Central Florida at the time was far bigger than we thought. They, many of the adults and the children are enwrapped in fabrics. The, the adults are wearing some of the things they might have worn in life. For the children who probably ran around essentially without clothes, they had to have these burial garments made for them. 
And the weave is a particularly unusual kind of three weft twining that represents a major investment of labor and energy. The perishable technology that these bodies are buried with would literally fill rooms, items made out of bone, items made out of wood, but all the stone tools in the burials would fit in your hand. And that that goes to underscore two things. One, the relative importance of non-durable technology to those groups. And two, the general scarcity of lithics in that part of Florida of any kind, let alone let alone projectile points, which are not very common at that site either. And what we found there has changed our entire opinion about what archaic, so-called archaic populations in Florida are doing at that particular moment. They were not supposed to have been weaving these complex items. They're not supposed to have been burying their dead in substantial numbers. These guys are actually interred in plots that were marked with stakes that seem to be family plots because the weaves of the fabrics are idiosyncratically different enough from plot to plot to say they represent different cohorts of related weavers. And these are some of the things you can infer from the non-durable remains at that locality. And so it was a truly spectacular site. As soon as they thought, they being Glenn Dorn and Dave Dickel, the excavators at Florida State, as soon as they thought they might have fabrics, they called Pitt. We flew down, my late wife and I flew down and looked at this material and determined that, in fact, it was woven in much the same way that Olga Soffer flashed on her refrigerator during one admittedly drunken evening in in Illinois where she was on the faculty, an image of an item from Central Europe that turned out to be a 29,000-year-old impression of a shirt woven with such precision that it would match the T-shirt you guys are wearing now. Wow. So occasionally, and that's another message, you encounter things in any field that you're not trained to find, that you don't expect will be there. And I think you have to be open-minded enough to be able to understand what it is you're looking at and what the significance of it might be be from a wholly different perspective than the one that obtains at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, again, that leads to the question of technology. And so often we think of, you know, ancient technology as that stone implement. But again, when we're looking at the fabrics from Wendover, uh, how are they making those? Are we talking about twisting of natural fibers? Are we looking at the use of a loom or something similar to that? Again, we we fail to recognize technology in the ancient world oftentimes. And as you say, the perishable technology, something that is so integral to everyday life is you know overlooked. So uh, again, just referring to those very clear indications of fabric uh, from Wendover, because they're, they're beautifully made. If you see the pictures and the photographs, uh, what technology are they using at that time to create that? They're using palmetto fibers that have been basically spun and they're using non heddle ground looms or hanging looms to make these things. And we never imagined that's what they were doing at that particular moment in time, just as we never imagined that thousands of years earlier, they were doing that kind of thing in central Europe. We didn't imagine in central Europe, they were using nets possibly for hunting when terrestrial net hunting is part of the repertoire of hunter-gatherers in the past, we think about nets for catching fish. We don't think about nets for catching rabbits. And yet survival in many environments is contingent on the ability to produce those kinds of things. I have a theory that everything being equal, similar, similar populations of human beings will come to the same types of inventions and technological innovations on a similar time scale. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that 
For instance, when we look at the beginnings of the manipulation of plant fiber, I think that with Homo sapiens sapiens, with us, it's actually an event horizon that you can see, you know, to follow your line of reasoning, across a very broad area with different populations, beginning to elaborate a technology which has its beginnings far earlier. Recently, they've discovered Neanderthal cordage. And so I'm not surprised at all that they're making string because it's like so many other technologies, like those early spears from from sites in Germany. They represent a technology that will become much more elaborated later in time, but which we've ignored utterly in all of our reconstructions for the sake of things that are preserved. I mean, with the exception of pottery, which on more recent sites is extremely common, stone tools go all the way back to the beginning. But I'm sure if we had preservation that goes all the way back to the beginning, we'd have plant fiber artifacts, we'd have wooden artifacts, we'd have leather artifacts, we'd have all kinds of other stuff in the technology of these groups. And to, again, answer your question, I think many human populations go through these adaptational moments at roughly the same time. It may be that in some areas you get kind of a head start, like the rise of state-level societies occurs in places where you have potentially domesticable plants and animals. But by and large, for every other kind of invention other than the rise of so-called pure or pristine states, you do have a commonality of, of time that, that matches what you're talking about. Yes. Well, Dr. Adavezu, you have been so gracious with your time this evening. I'd like to conclude just by saying, avocationalist though I am personally, you have been an influence on so many archaeologists and you have been the most influential archaeologist personally for me after reading so much of your work, after studying your work and learning from your contributions to archaeology. And so it means a lot to me personally to be able to sit here and to be able to converse with you about these issues that are still so relevant as we are learning about the ancient past. If you have a final word that you'd like to share for other up-and-coming archaeologists or just enthusiasts who have questions about human origins, what would you like to convey to them? I think when Lou Binford came along in the 1960s and 70s and said there basically is no limit to what we can learn from the ground, that he was probably close to correct if you know how to extract that information. And oftentimes, I think the extraction of the information is as or more critical than what you do with it. If you don't know how to collect the data, if you can't rigorously control the 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 location temporally and spatially of the information you're collecting, if you can't address the who's of the past, the why's of the past, or, or the, the when's of the past, the what's of the past, then trying to do anything else just doesn't work. And I think because of the way we train students, you can only emphasize so much certain things during any student's career. You can emphasize methodology at the expense of theory, and I'm not a theoretical nihilist by any stretch of the imagination, but in any case, if you don't know how to collect the data, the theories that you put together about anything are probably questionable at best. And so I would say that there needs to be in the training process not only a familiarity with things that most archaeologists, unfortunately, are not learning these days, 
about how the data is collected, but about the landscape's history before, during, and after a human presence at that location. You have to understand the stage upon which people performed as much as what the actors and actresses of antiquity are doing. And remembering that there were actresses as well as actors is also a critical part of the learning process. And unfortunately or otherwise, we, most institutions don't do it that way anymore. Yes. Well, we want to thank you for your time tonight, Dr. Adavazio, and we certainly hope this won't be the last time you join us here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Well, thank you very kindly for the opportunity of talking to you gentlemen again, and uh, good luck with the rest of your series and anyone else you may have on the show. Indeed. You're going to be a hard act to follow, though. I'm going to warn you. (laughs) Thanks again, Doc. You're welcome. for Dr. Adebezio coming on the show. It's always a really humbling experience to speak with someone of his stature in the field. And it certainly is. Again, as we said with him on the microphone, for me personally, it was highly influential reading his works. And uh, of course, those recommended to us, Jason and I sitting down there at the University of South Carolina, and Dr. Albert Goodyear saying, you should get this book. That'll help you guys. And so it's kind of like that to get pseudo mythical here for a moment you know that archetypal experience of the young seeker uh, who is gifted by the wise sage with this tome of knowledge right and it's almost a tolkien-esque kind of experience you know jason and i feeling like we're starting a certain journey and we've gone to speak to this wise master and the book he gives us is of course the work of jm atavazio and so we take this great journey And we literally go to an ancient cave and speak to him about the archaeology that he conducted there. Now, again, you know, that's an interesting way to phrase it, but often that is how it feels. It's a bit of a journey when we get out there and we share experiences with people who have spent their professional careers and really built their legacy around the work that they have done and the way that they have helped shape our understanding of the past in doing so. That is what Dr. Adavazio has done, as have others like Dr. Tom Delahaye, who we've spoken with, and others we will speak to in the future as we continue the legacy series here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Absolutely. So this series will continue uh, both overseas and with other archaeologists throughout the United States, but we have a lot of great guests lined up for this season uh, of the legacy series. So we're looking forward to further conversations Again, follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, Don't forget to leave us those reviews. Very important. And as always, thank you for tuning in to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Yes, it is indeed our pleasure to be able to offer you guys the very best in history and archaeology. And again, this show would not exist without you, the listeners. We, of course, enjoy hearing from all of you whenever you guys are able to send along your thoughts, your ideas, your reviews and even donations. And of course, be sure and follow us there on the social media channels that Jason's talking about. We love to interact with our audience also. Gentlemen, I think it's about time for us to interact with a pumpkin spice latte or whatever other beverage you may prefer, although I do think that they have stouter liquids they serve over there at the Cross Time Pub. On behalf of geologist James Waldo, Jason Pentrail, and yours truly, Micah Hanks, we will catch you again right here next time on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. (laughs) 